Okay. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me on my talk Beyond Pushing Code, the lessons I learned at Dynatrace uh, on our GitHub journey. My name is Simon Schrottner. I'm uh, working at the Dynatrace Ospen. I'm a maintainer of JUnit Pioneer, and, um, and I would call myself an open source enthusiast. If you have questions after the talk or later on and want to know something or have some suggestion, you have there my social media, as a social media links. I'm always happy if you contact me. Well, today we will shortly talk about what actually is an OSPO because most of you maybe already ask themselves what this might be. We will shortly talk about GitHub, the curses and also the blessings and the curses we have with it, the organizations, our community standards and the user management. So. What is an OSPO actually? Well, people in our company jokingly say we are the open source police. We are removing the fun out of their open source work, adding unnecessary bureaucracy, and just being annoying every time they want to contribute somewhere, etc. But that's actually not the case. Well, somehow it's true, but in the end, what we really try to do is to help Dynatrace and our employees to grow and building processes and workflows that we have some kind of standardized. Uh, standardized approach on how we are working with open source and on GitHub. We want to ensure that our employees uh, do proper practice, as a, uh, ensure proper practices, and we also want to enable our employees so that they have, uh, that they can easily contribute to open source and work with open source. The important part is, as I already said, it's, it's when creating, contributing, and most importantly, also using open source. And this is not all, uh, this happens not, uh, this is not just Dynatrace exclusive, but this happens on all our adventures. So, for example, uh, we support the Open Feature Community, which is a CNCF sandbox uh, project, or the Captain uh, project, which is already a CNCF incubating project. Uh, if you want to learn more regarding OSPOs, because this talk is not about OSPOs, there is a really good uh, community around that. That's the to-do group, which focuses on tooling, processes, etc., which you can implement uh, for your own OSPO. Uh, there is the Chaos community, which provides really nice metrics regarding open source communities, how you gather them and how they are defined. And GitHub's OSPO on its own is a really good resource if you want to know something uh, what you can do actually uh, with, within your own OSPO. And this brings me already to the next topic, GitHub itself. Well, GitHub is cool. GitHub is really easy to use. You create your profile, you can create your account, you can fork some repository, you can create your repositories. It's really so easy, there are no boundaries for anybody. And that's me is also one of the biggest curses for us as a company. Because it is so easy. People forget where they are working or where they are pushing code to. And it might inflict that, we, that they are uh, via, uh, sorry, uh, publishing our intellectual property, which we do not want to actually uh, out there. Furthermore, which is for us way more important, is that GitHub and our open source projects and how we interact with them is actually a public image from our company. It shows how we are working, how we are living with the company, uh, with the company, with communities, and what we really want to leverage uh, working with them. And the most critical part is actually the legal aspect. Just because something is open source does not mean it's really valuable and usable for our company. So, but let's get back to the original topic of our talk, our journey at Dynatrace or our adventure. And this actually for me, it started uh, way back in May, actually close to a year ago. Back then we had five known GitHub organizations and everybody in our company was and is still allowed to use their private GitHub account. But this makes everything a little bit more complicated. My goal or my uh, quest was to reduce our manual work and also to create a little bit better transparency within the processes, create more historical data and logs that we can actually better improve our uh, work with our employees and to enhance our user management because it was at that time quite complicated. There was one big limitation and this was no enterprise subscription. We do have our own version control system, so GitHub is more like a sidecar and we do not want to pay for each user out there. Uh, and this brings us already to, the, to inspecting our world, our GitHub organizations in general. Be because before I want to start working on something, I want to explore my world and want to know what I am dealing with. So I took a look uh, around and said, hey, what does it look like? Who is using it? 
and most likely what are the use cases we, are, we, we try to handle within GitHub. Well, what does it look like? I covered already, it was around five organizations. Who is using it? Close to everyone in the company. We have more than 1,300 developers. We are more than 3,000 employees overall and really everybody could be a potential user for our GitHub usage, also for GitHub. The use cases are the most interesting ones. There's the one where we said, hey, open source development, like everybody normally does on GitHub. The second part was the public development, which is a more interesting use case. We sometimes also call it fake open source because we just develop our software on GitHub but do not expect any kind of contributions or do not want to have any kind of community build out of it. And the most funny use case, use case we had was actually the bypass of network restrictions. Our sales engineers sometimes set up demo environments and wanted to store their configurations and want to have a history for that. But setting up a configuration from a virtual machine through a VPN is sometimes really tedious and painful. GitHub was a really nice tool to handle that, actually. But within my research, I made a really big discovery because I found an, another organization and then another and then another. And I suddenly asked myself, hey, what I'm really dealing with, how much or GitHub organizations are really out there containing intellect, may, maybe containing intellectual property of Dynatrace. So I asked the great wizard GitHub API, please tell me all the GitHub organizations with, the ID, Dyna, also with an ID containing Dynatrace. And I found around 130 organizations. That's also a little bit related to the curse because it's so easy to create a GitHub organization. Well, tip on the side, if you ever need to do this, also search for a name and description because I know by now that there are way more than just 130 organizations out there. So those 130 organizations are not really all relevant for us. Some of them are just demo environments. Some of them really do have alleged purpose and people what they're doing with this organization is fine. The problem is just they are bypassing our tooling and nobody was aware of them. Evaluating those, we are still in the prog progress of that because there are so many and it's always hard to figure out who is now really the owner of that organization, etc. So there's one learning from that and that's uh, something I ask everybody here. So if you ever think you need to create a GitHub organization for your company, uh, think twice if maybe is there, there is already one which you can use. And if you really need to do it, document it. If you have a future OSPO or an entity in your company which needs to handle that, they will be for sure happy if they know about that upfront. So now as we know already what we are dealing with, or at least we know what is out there, but we do not have the overview of everything. We thought it's time to think about our creed and our community standards, because we want to create nice neighborhoods where everybody can grow with themselves, with their contributions, etc. So therefore, we needed some kind of community standards. But also, on the other hand, we wanted to reduce the maintainer effort. Community standards in the source, in the kind of in the perspective of open source are simply the default guidance for everyone. everyone. We want to know what is the project about, what I'm allowed to do, and also uh, how I can contribute. How can I re uh, report security incidents? And how we work together. Or the translated way for the developers out there. The readme, the license, the contributing, the security, and the code of conduct, actually. Because those are files which are most likely represented in every repository. Regarding the README and the license, we, were, we are still really, really strict. That means if there is no README and no license, the, pub, the projects are pub, uh, not public anymore and private. For the others, uh, they are a little bit different because normally, as we said, they are part of each repository. There's a little, little difference between those for each repository. Most of the time, they're actually really the same. There's the code of conduct, which looks the same for the whole company. The problem here is as soon as we update some one of the one of those, we need to update it in every repository. And this makes it really hard to maintain. Having 300 repositories, opening 300 pull requests just for a text update in the README is a lot of effort actually to get this merged. So in our ideal world, we provide an always up-to-date uh, default, which provides as a which uh, creates little effort for everybody involved, for the maintainers and for even for us who are providing these files. For that, if uh, there is a really cool way, is the .github repository. 
This is a really nice and neat little feature most people are not aware of, which you can put into your organization and store defaults for those files, except the readme and the license. Furthermore, it helps you to provide a little nice overview at, uh, at the beginning of your, uh, sorry, at the uh, organization overview page with information regarding your organization. And the most important and interesting part is you can store organization-wide configurations there, like for Renovate or for Insolidarity Bot, et cetera, which makes it, which makes life for a lot of developers really also easier. The big downside is, well, we have multiple organizations, so we still have one repository per organization and it's not visible within the code. So if you just check out the code and share it with somebody, they might miss this information. But we generated a really simple default. There is not much to do if you want to update anything because it's just within one repository. And maintainers still have the possibility to override the files if they have some kind of special need. And this maintainers actually brings us also further to our user management and our residents. As I said, the initial management, also the initial user management was not scalable. And it required a lot of, really a lot of manual work. It looked like this. You first had to provide your uh, GitHub information that it gets entered into AD. This triggered an invite to our main GitHub organization and from there on, wait, sorry. And from there on, people got invited to, we could manually invite the people to the other organizations. This was really tiresome. First, there was this mandatory membership of the organization, so people had access to everything within the main organization, although they might not need it. Furthermore, uh, there was this manual effort to gain the membership of the other organizations, and the, one of the biggest flaws we had in there was actually that the GitHub audit log was our only resource when somebody was added to an organization. We did not know, know, did not knew why or if there was a, what kind of connection we had with some kind of Jira ticket. So our requirements were, we wanted, to be, we wanted to have a more transparent way. We wanted to have a way which is easy to use and allowed actually for self-management for the users. And ideally, we have a lot of historical information attached to it. This already screams like GitOps all over the way. The second requirement was that we did not only wanted to do our user management with that tool, but we also wanted to create our teams our repositories, and our, ideally the permission arrangement. And therefore we find, found a really cool tool out in the open source community, and this is Perivolos. Why Perivolos is so cool? Well, it's actually the tool which also Kubernetes uses to handle their user management. So they are, it, it scales really well, they have a lot of organizations and a lot of repositories, and they're also handling the user and team management. There is this talk, uh, especially regarding this, uh, regarding Peribolos from the KubeCon Europe 2019, if you want to see or hear more about it. And it's a YAML-based file, so it's really easy, easy to read, and we can easily reuse it for our other projects. There are just a few considerations. One YAML file for 3,000 employees is quite a big file and quite hard to manage. One line per employee is quite hard. The other question is what you always have to ask yourself when you're using that is, what is your source of truth? Because actually Active Directory is our source of truth for all our employees. We want to, we want to have this information. When is somebody still a member of the, of the company? When should he have access, etc.? And this led us to different approaches where we always did opinion, so called, uh, we call it opinionated configurations. For Dynatrace, we are using actually AD as our source of truth. For our other projects like Captain or Open Feature, where you can see this, where you can actually see this in action, we used a different approach where we build our own configuration with our own little Go script, which is way easier to read and also allows non-technical people to understand actually our member structure. So what we achieved was actually an easy overview uh, where we empower the people to do actually those things on their own with simple pull requests. It's really transparent. Everybody can see who has access to what and not, nothing is hidden behind some kind of obscure structure or uh, behind a lot of manual efforts and the organizations are decoupled. Um, so this leads us to one, one really funny uh, occurrence actually within the company and that was the purge. So now as we, as we actually knew who is part of, uh, who needs to be part of which organization and who is, uh, as we decoupled them and the main organization is now free, we could actually restrict their, the access of the people. 
Also, we had a change of subscription. So suddenly our main organization also needed a team subscription. And we wanted to save that money with not paying for licenses we do not need. So we defined some metrics on uh, which users are actually the ones uh, we do not care about. So that was quite simple. It's no code changes, no issues, no pull requests, and no commands within a certain point of time and try to figure it out. GitHub is really helpful there because they actually have their own script which you can use to find inactive users. The, here comes the fun part actually. We, we managed to reduce our users in this organization from around 450 users to 130 users, which is actually quite a lot and saves actually also a lot of money in, in that kind of regard. The fun discoveries is here, first of all. Some employees used their private account as a bot user and suddenly had some kind of issues because of these restrictions. And the most funny part actually was the way of me saying hi to the company with opening a pull request with 400 people in there and saying, hey, you get removed your access. And everybody was quite not happy with this big pull request and a lot of comments they needed to deal with. So the question is now, you might ask, because I talked about an adventure, where, as a, where are the monsters? Did we slay any monsters, any dragons? Well, was there an ogre in front of a bridge blocking us? Actually, no, no, it's not the case. We are still at the beginning of our adventure. There's so much ahead of us and so much we need to do or want to do with our organizations. But, and this is the part why, I, uh, why I'm doing this talk, is actually, I hope my insight helps you on your adventures. The open source community is a community where we grow together based on our experiences and based on the things we learn and share with each other. And I hope uh, that this talk really helps you with your OSPO adventures or your GitHub adventures. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I think there is still time for questions. I'm not sure, I have, do not have an overview of the time. There is the agenda. If you do not feel comfortable talking now, you can always contact me on social media. Thank you very much. Yeah? Uh, how do you deal with the legal stuff? You mentioned licenses. Is there a, a default license or a recommended set of licenses that the contributors can use if they're starting a new project or how does that work? Okay, the question was how, how do we deal with default licensing or licensing in Dynatrace in general? So for our open source projects, the projects we are creating, there is just one license uh, license we normally allow to use, and that's the Apache v2 license. If other projects want, so if you want to use a, uh, another license, the pe people have to actively uh, discuss about this and have uh, management approval. But normally, everything is Apache v2. Yeah, I think. Any other questions? <laughs> How many hidden organizations did you plant? You mentioned you started up with 130 initially, uh, and then later you discovered that it was more. Uh, so the question is, how many, how many hidden organizations did I find? Well. Yes, I said there are more. I found three or four so far. I did not check for name and description because my backlog is still quite big. You have to contact either GitHub or find a repository with a commit in there to figure out who is actually the owner of the repository. And you need to be lucky that this, this GitHub username is actually attached to an employee within AD. If you do not have that, you can try to contact them, etc. And that's really a tiresome process, and it really takes a lot of effort to get this back on to, also back on board. No. Okay. Yeah, I'm fine. So, <laughs> if there are no more questions, thank you very much. I hope you at least enjoyed the talk and can take something with you along the way. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.